Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to some new members of our Patreon family. Pete, Anna, Ian, and Emily. Thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. By becoming members of Patreon, you help us remain 100% listener-supported and ad-free for everyone, and it's very much appreciated. If you are interested in supporting Boring Books for Bedtime and finding out more about the perks available to subscribers, including exclusive episodes heard nowhere else, you'll find a link to Patreon in the show description. You'll also find a link to buymeacoffee.com, where you can support us with a one-time tip, no subscription required. I hope you'll take a moment to check them out. Now, let's read and relax. Find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. Tonight, let's continue an annual February tradition on this podcast and relax with more from On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life, by Charles Darwin, M.A., Fellow of the Royal Geological Linnaean Etc. Societies, and author of Journal of Researches during H.M.S. Beagle's Voyage Round the World, from the first edition, published in 1859, by John Murray, Albemarle Street, London. Let's pick up right where we left off, near the end of Chapter 3, The Struggle for Existence. Let's begin. In the case of every species, many different checks, acting at different periods of life and during different seasons or years, probably come into play. Some one check or some few being generally the most potent, but all concurring in determining the average number or even the existence of the species. In some cases, it can be shown that widely different checks act on the same species in different districts. When we look at the plants and bushes clothing an entangled bank, we are tempted to attribute their proportional numbers and kinds to what we call chance. But how false a view is this? Everyone has heard that when an American forest is cut down, a very different vegetation springs up. But it has been observed that the trees now growing on the ancient Indian mounds in the southern United States display the same beautiful diversity and proportion of kinds as in the surrounding virgin forests. What a struggle between the several kinds of trees must here have gone on during long centuries, each annually scattering its seeds by the thousand. What war between insect and insect, between insects, snails, and other animals with birds and beasts of prey, all striving to increase and all feeding on each other or on the trees, or their seeds or seedlings, or on the other plants which first clothed the ground and thus checked the growth of the trees. Throw up a handful of feathers, and all must fall to the ground according to definite laws. But how simple is this problem compared to the action and reaction of the innumerable plants and animals which have determined, in the course of centuries, the proportional numbers and kinds of trees now growing on the old Indian ruins. 
the dependency of one organic being on another, as of a parasite on its prey, lies generally between beings remote in the scale of nature. This is often the case with those which may strictly be said to struggle with each other for existence, as in the case of locusts and grass-feeding quadrupeds. But the struggle almost invariably will be most severe between the individuals of the same species, for they frequent the same districts, require the same food, and are exposed to the same dangers. In the case of varieties of the same species, the struggle will generally be almost equally severe, and we sometimes see the contest soon decided. For instance, if several varieties of wheat be sown together, and the mixed seed be re-sown, some of the varieties which best suit the soil or climate, or are naturally the most fertile, will beat the others, and so yield more seed, and will consequently in a few years quite supplant the other varieties. To keep up a mixed stock of even such extremely close varieties as the variously colored sweet peas, they must be each year harvested separately, and the seed then mixed into proportion. Otherwise, the weaker kinds will steadily decrease in numbers and disappear. So again with the varieties of sheep, it has been asserted that certain mountain varieties will starve out other mountain varieties so that they cannot be kept together. The same result has followed from keeping together different varieties of the medicinal leech. It may even be doubted whether the varieties of any one of our domestic plants or animals have so exactly the same strength, habits, and constitution that the original proportions of a mixed stock could be kept up for half a dozen generations, if they were allowed to struggle together, like beings in a state of nature, and if the seed or young were not annually sorted. As species of the same genus have usually, though by no means invariably, some similarity in habits and constitution, and always in structure, the struggle will generally be more severe between species of the same genus when they come into competition with each other than between species of distinct genera. We see this in their recent extension over parts of the United States of one species of swallow, having caused the decrease of another species. The recent increase of the missile thrush in parts of Scotland has caused the decrease of the song thrush, how frequently we hear of one species of rat taking the place of another species under the most different climates. In Russia, the small Asiatic cockroach has everywhere driven before it its great congener. One species of charlock will supplant another, and so in other cases. We can dimly see why the competition should be most severe between allied forms which fill nearly the same place in the economy of nature. But probably in no one case could we precisely say why one species has been victorious over another in the great battle of life. A corollary of the highest importance may be deduced from the foregoing remarks, namely, that the structure of every organic being is related in the most essential yet often hidden manner to that of all other organic beings with which it comes into competition for food or residence, or from which it has to escape, or on which it preys. This is obvious in the structure of the teeth and talons of the tiger, and in that of the legs and claws of the parasite which clings to the hair on the tiger's body but in the beautifully plumed seed of the dandelion, and in the flattened and fringed legs of the water beetle, the relation seems at first confined to the elements of air and water. Yet the advantage of plumed seeds no doubt stands in the closest relation to the land, being already thickly clothed by other plants, so that the seeds may be widely distributed 
and fall on unoccupied ground. In the water beetle, the structure of its legs, so well adapted for diving, allows it to compete with other aquatic insects, to hunt for its own prey, and to escape serving as prey to other animals. The store of nutriment laid up within the seeds of many plants seems at first sight to have no sort of relation to other plants, but from the strong growth of young plants produced from such seeds as peas and beans, when sown in the midst of long grass, I suspect that the chief use of the nutriment in the seed is to favor the growth of the young seedling, whilst struggling with other plants growing vigorously all around. Look at a plant in the midst of its range. Why does it not double or quadruple its numbers? We know that it can perfectly well withstand a little more heat or cold, dampness or dryness, for elsewhere it ranges into slightly hotter or colder, damper or drier districts. In this case, we can clearly see that if we wished in imagination to give the plant the power of increasing in number, we should have to give it some advantage over its competitors or over the animals which preyed on it, on the confines of its geographical range. A change of constitution with respect to climate would clearly be an advantage to our plant. But we have reason to believe that only a few plants or animals range so far, that they are destroyed by the rigor of the climate alone. Not until we reach the extreme confines of life in the Arctic regions or on the borders of an utter desert will competition cease. The land may be extremely cold or dry, yet there will be competition between some few species or between the individuals of the same species, for the warmest or dampest spots. Hence also, we can see that when a plant or animal is placed in a new country amongst new competitors, though the climate may be exactly the same as in its former home, yet the conditions of its life will generally be changed in an essential manner. If we wished to increase its average numbers in its new home, we should have to modify it in a different way to what we should have done in its native country, for we should have to give it some advantage over a different set of competitors or enemies. It is good thus to try in our imagination to give any form some advantage over another. Probably in no single instance should we know what to do so as to succeed. It will convince us of our ignorance on the mutual relations of all organic beings, a conviction as necessary as it seems to be difficult to acquire. All that we can do is to keep steadily in mind that each organic being is striving to increase at a geometrical ratio that each at some period of its life, during some season of the year, during each generation or at intervals, has to struggle for life and to suffer great destruction. When we reflect on this struggle, we may console ourselves with the full belief that the war of nature is not incessant, that no fear is felt, that death is generally prompt, and that the vigorous, the healthy, and the happy survive and multiply. Chapter 4. Natural Selection Natural Selection. Its power compared with man's selection. Its power on characters of trifling importance. Its power at all ages and on both sexes. Sexual Selection on the generality of intercrosses between individuals of the same species. Circumstances favorable and unfavorable to natural selection, namely intercrossing, isolation, number of individuals. Slow action. Extinction caused by natural selection. Divergence of character, 
related to the diversity of inhabitants of any small area, and to naturalization. Action of natural selection through divergence of character and extinction on the descendants from a common parent explains the grouping of all organic beings. How will the struggle for existence, discussed too briefly in the last chapter, act in regard to variation? Can the principle of selection, which we have seen is so potent in the hands of man, apply in nature? I think we shall see that it can act most effectually. Let it be borne in mind in what an endless number of strange peculiarities are domestic productions, and in a lesser degree, those under nature vary, and how strong the hereditary tendency is. Under domestication, it may be truly said that the whole organization becomes in some degree plastic. Let it be borne in mind how infinitely complex and close-fitting are the mutual relations of all organic beings to each other and to their physical conditions of life. Can it then be thought improbable, seeing that variations useful to man have undoubtedly occurred, that other variations useful in some way to each being in the great and complex battle of life should sometimes occur in the course of thousands of generations. If such do occur, can we doubt, remembering that many more individuals are born than can possibly survive, that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others, would have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind? On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. Variations neither useful nor injurious would not be affected by natural selection and would be left a fluctuating element as perhaps we see in the species called polymorphic. We shall best understand the probable course of a natural selection by taking the case of a country undergoing some physical change, for instance, of climate. The proportional numbers of its inhabitants would almost immediately undergo a change, and some species might become extinct. We may conclude from what we have seen of the intimate and complex manner in which the inhabitants of each country are bound together, that any change in the numerical proportions of some of the inhabitants, independently of the change of climate itself, would most seriously affect many of the others. If the country were open on its borders, new forms would certainly immigrate and this also would seriously disturb the relations of some of the former inhabitants. Let it be remembered how powerful the influence of a single introduced tree or mammal has been shown to be. But in the case of an island, or of a country partly surrounded by barriers, into which new and better adapted forms could not freely enter, we should then have places in the economy of nature which would assuredly be better filled up if some of the original inhabitants were in some manner modified. For had the area been open to immigration, these same places would have been seized on by intruders. In such case, every slight modification which in the course of ages chanced to arise and which in any way favored the individuals of any of the species by better adapting them to their altered conditions would tend to be preserved, and natural selection would thus have free scope for the work of improvement. We have reason to believe, as stated in the first chapter, that a change in the conditions of life, by specially acting on the reproductive system, causes or increases variability, 
and in the foregoing case, the conditions of life are supposed to have undergone a change, and this would manifestly be favorable to natural selection by giving a better chance of profitable variations occurring. And unless profitable variations do occur, natural selection can do nothing. Not that, as I believe, any extreme amount of variability is necessary, as man can certainly produce great results by adding up in any given direction mere individual differences, so could nature, but far more easily, from having incomparably longer time at her disposal. Nor do I believe that any great physical change, as of climate, or any unusual degree of isolation to check immigration, is actually necessary to produce new and unoccupied places for natural selection to fill up by modifying and improving some of the varying inhabitants. For as all the inhabitants of each country are struggling together with nicely balanced forces, Extremely slight modifications in the structure or habits of one inhabitant would often give it an advantage over others, and still further modifications of the same kind would often still further increase the advantage. No country can be named in which all the native inhabitants are now so perfectly adapted to each other and to the physical conditions under which they live that none of them could anyhow be improved. For in all countries, the natives have been so far conquered by naturalized productions that they have allowed foreigners to take firm possession of the land, and as foreigners have thus everywhere beaten some of the natives, we may safely conclude that the natives might have been modified with advantage so as to have better resisted such intruders. As man can produce and certainly has produced a great result by his methodical and unconscious means of selection, what may not nature affect? Man can act only on external and visible characters. Nature cares nothing for appearances, except insofar as they may be useful to any being. She can act on every internal organ, on every shade of constitutional difference, on the whole machinery of life. Man selects only for his own good, nature only for that of the being which she tends. Every selected character is fully exercised by her, and the being is placed under well-suited conditions of life. Man keeps the natives of many climates in the same country. He seldom exercises each selected character in some peculiar and fitting manner. He feeds a long and a short-beaked pigeon on the same food. He does not exercise a long-backed or long-legged quadruped in any peculiar manner. He exposes sheep with long and short wool to the same climate. He does not rigidly destroy all inferior animals, but protects during each varying season, as far as lies in his power, all his productions. He often begins his selection by some half-monstrous form, or at least by some modification prominent enough to catch his eye or to be plainly useful to him. Under nature, the slightest difference of structure or constitution may well turn the nicely balanced scale in the struggle for life, and so be preserved. How fleeting are the wishes and efforts of man! How short his time! And consequently, how poor will his products be! compared with those accumulated by nature during whole geological periods. Can we wonder, then, that nature's production should be far truer in character than man's productions, that they should be infinitely better adapted to the most complex conditions of life, 
and should plainly bear the stamp of far higher workmanship. It may be said that natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing throughout the world every variation, even the slightest, rejecting that which is bad, preserving and adding up all that is good, silently and insensibly working, whenever and wherever opportunity offers, at the improvement of each organic being in relation to its organic and inorganic conditions of life. We see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the long lapse of ages. And then, so imperfect is our view into long past geological ages that we only see that the forms of life are now different from what they formerly were. Although natural selection can act only through and for the good of each being, yet characters and structures, which we are apt to consider as of very trifling importance, may thus be acted on. When we see leaf-eating insects green and bark feeders mottled gray, the alpine ptarmigan white in winter, the red grouse the color of heather, and the black grouse that of peaty earth, we must believe that these tints are of service to these birds and insects in preserving them from danger. Grouse, if not destroyed at some period of their lives, would increase in countless numbers. They are known to suffer largely from birds of prey, and hawks are guided by eyesight to their prey. So much so that on parts of the continent, persons are warned not to keep white pigeons as being the most liable to destruction. Hence, I can see no reason to doubt that natural selection might be most effective in giving the proper color to each kind of grouse, and in keeping that color, when once acquired, true and constant. Nor ought we to think that the occasional destruction of an animal of any particular color would produce little effect. We should remember how essential it is, in a flock of white sheep, to destroy every lamb with the faintest trace of black. In plants, the down on the fruit and the color of the flesh are considered by botanists as characters of the most trifling importance. Yet we hear from an excellent horticulturist, Downing, that in the United States, smooth-skinned fruits suffer far more from a beetle, a curculio, than those with down that purple plums suffer far more from a certain disease than yellow plums, whereas another disease attacks yellow-fleshed peaches far more than those with other colored flesh. If with all the aids of art, these slight differences make a great difference in cultivating the several varieties, assuredly in a state of nature where the trees would have to struggle with other trees and with a host of enemies, such differences would effectually settle which variety, whether a smooth or downy, a yellow or purple-fleshed fruit, should succeed. In looking at many small points of difference between species, which as far as our ignorance permits us to judge, seem to be quite unimportant, we must not forget that climate, food, etc. probably produce some slight and direct effect. It is, however, far more necessary to bear in mind that there are many unknown laws of correlation of growth, which, when one part of the organization is modified through variation, and the modifications are accumulated by natural selection for the good of the being, will cause other modifications, often of the most unexpected nature. As we see that those variations which under domestication appear at any particular period of life tend to reappear in the offspring at the same period, for instance, in the seeds of the many varieties of our culinary and agricultural plants, in the caterpillar and cocoon stages of the varieties of the silkworm, 
in the eggs of poultry, and in the color of the down of their chickens, in the horns of our sheep and cattle when nearly adult. So, in a state of nature, natural selection will be enabled to act on and modify organic beings at any age, by the accumulation of profitable variations at that age, and by their inheritance at a corresponding age. If it profit a plant to have its seeds more and more widely disseminated by the wind, I can see no greater difficulty in this being affected through natural selection than in the cotton planter increasing and improving by selection the down in the pods on his cotton trees. Natural selection may modify and adapt the larva of an insect to a score of contingencies, wholly different from those which concern the mature insect. These modifications will no doubt affect, through the laws of correlation, the structure of the adult, and probably in the case of those insects which live only for a few hours and which never feed, a large part of their structure is merely the correlated result of successive changes in the structure of their larvae. So, conversely, Modifications in the adult will probably often affect the structure of the larva, but in all cases, natural selection will ensure that modifications, consequent on other modifications, at a different period of life, shall not be in the least degree injurious, for if they became so, they would cause the extinction of the species. Natural selection will modify the structure of the young in relation to the parent, and of the parent in relation to the young. In social animals, it will adapt the structure of each individual for the benefit of the community, if each in consequence profits by the selected change. What natural selection cannot do is to modify the structure of one species without giving it any advantage for the good of another species. And those statements to this effect may be found in works of natural history. I cannot find one case which will bear investigation. A structure used only once in an animal's whole life, if of high importance to it, might be modified to any extent by natural selection. For instance, the great jaws possessed by certain insects and used exclusively for opening the cocoon, or the hard tip to the beak of nestling birds used for breaking the egg. It has been asserted that of the best short-beaked tumbler pigeons, more perish in the egg than are able to get out of it, so that fanciers assist in the act of hatching. Now if nature has to make the beak of a full-grown pigeon very short for the bird's own advantage, the process of modification would be very slow, and there would be simultaneously the most rigorous selection of the young birds within the egg, which had the most powerful and hardest beaks, for all with weak beaks would inevitably perish. Or more delicate and more easily broken shells might be selected, the thickness of the shell being known to vary like every other structure. Inasmuch as peculiarities often appear under domestication in one sex and become hereditarily attached to that sex, the same fact probably occurs under nature. And if so, natural selection will be able to modify one sex in its functional relations to the other sex, or in relation to wholly different habits of life in the two sexes, as is sometimes the case with insects. And this leads me to say a few words on what I call sexual selection. This depends not on a struggle for existence, but on a struggle between the males for possession of the females. The result is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but few or no offspring. Sexual selection is therefore less rigorous than natural selection. Generally, the most vigorous males, those which are best fitted for their places in nature, 
will leave most progeny. But in many cases, victory will depend not on general vigor, but on having special weapons confined to the male sex. A hornless stag or spurless cock would have a poor chance of leaving offspring. Sexual selection by always allowing the victor to breed might surely give indomitable courage, length to the spur, and strength to the wing to strike in the spurred leg. How low in the scale of nature this law of battle descends, I know not. Male alligators have been described as fighting, bellowing, and whirling round like dancers in a war dance for the possession of the females. Male salmons have been seen fighting all day long. Male stag beetles often bear wounds from the huge mandibles of other males. The war is perhaps severest between the males of polygamous animals, and these seem oftenest provided with special weapons. The males of carnivorous animals are already well armed, though to them and to others, special means of defense may be given through means of sexual selection, as the mane to the lion, the shoulder pad to the boar, and the hooked jaw to the male salmon, for the shield may be as important for victory as the sword or spear. Amongst birds, the contest is often of a more peaceful character. All those who have attended to the subject believe that there is the severest rivalry between the males of many species to attract by singing the females. The rock thrush of Guiana, birds of paradise, and some others congregate, and successive males display their gorgeous plumage and perform strange antics before the females, which standing by as spectators at last choose the most attractive partner. Those who have closely attended to birds in confinement well know that they often take individual preferences and dislikes. Thus Sir Robert Heron has described how one pied peacock was eminently attractive to all his hen birds. It may appear childish to attribute any effect to such apparently weak means I cannot here enter on the details necessary to support this view, but if man can in a short time give elegant carriage and beauty to his bantams, according to his standard of beauty, I can see no good reason to doubt that female birds, by selecting during thousands of generations the most melodious or beautiful males, according to their standard of beauty, might produce a marked effect. I strongly suspect that some well-known laws with respect to the plumage of male and female birds in comparison with the plumage of the young can be explained on the view of plumage having been chiefly modified by sexual selection, acting when the birds have come to the breeding age or during the breeding season. The modifications thus produced being inherited at corresponding ages or seasons either by the males alone or by the males and females, but I have not space here to enter on this subject. Thus it is, as I believe, that when the males and females of any animal have the same general habits of life but differ in structure, color, or ornament, such differences have been mainly caused by sexual selection. That is, Individual males have had in successive generations some slight advantage over other males in their weapons, means of defense, or charms, and have transmitted these advantages to their male offspring. Yet I would not wish to attribute all such sexual differences to this agency, for we see peculiarities arising and becoming attached to the male sex in our domestic animals as the wattle in the male carriers, horn-like protuberances in the cocks of certain fowls, etc., which we cannot believe to be either useful to the males in battle or attractive to the females. We see analogous cases under nature. 
For instance, the tuft of hair on the breast of the turkey cock, which can hardly be either useful or ornamental to this bird. Indeed, had the tuft appeared under domestication, it would have been called a monstrosity. In order to make it clear how, as I believe, natural selection acts, I must beg permission to give one or two imaginary illustrations. Let us take the case of a wolf, which preys on various animals, securing some by craft, some by strength, and some by fleetness. And let us suppose that the fleetest prey, a deer for instance, had from any change in the country increased in numbers, or that other prey had decreased in numbers, during that season of the year when the wolf is hardest pressed for food. I can under such circumstances see no reason to doubt that the swiftest and slimmest wolves would have the best chance of surviving, and so be preserved or selected, provided always that they retained strength to master their prey at this or at some other period of the year, when they might be compelled to prey on other animals. I can see no more reason to doubt this than that man can improve the fleetness of his greyhounds by careful and methodical selection, or by that unconscious selection, which results from each man trying to keep the best dogs, without any thought of modifying the breed. Even without any change in the proportional numbers of the animals on which our wolf preyed, a cub might be born with an innate tendency to pursue certain kinds of prey, nor can this be thought very improbable, for we often observe great differences in the natural tendencies of our domestic animals, one cat, for instance, taking to catch rats, another mice. One cat, according to Mr. St. John, bringing home winged game, another hares or rabbits, and another hunting on marshy ground and almost nightly catching woodcocks or snipes. The tendency to catch rats rather than mice is known to be inherited. Now, if any slight innate change of habit or of structure benefited an individual wolf, it would have the best chance of surviving and of leaving offspring. Some of its young would probably inherit the same habits or structure, and by the repetition of this process, a new variety might be formed which would either supplant or coexist with the parent form of wolf. Or again, the wolves inhabiting a mountain district and those frequenting the lowlands would naturally be forced to hunt different prey, and from the continued preservation of the individuals best fitted for the two sites, two varieties might slowly be formed. These varieties would cross and blend where they met, but to this subject of intercrossing we shall soon have to return. I may add that according to Mr. Pierce, there are two varieties of the wolf inhabiting the Catskill Mountains in the United States, one with a light greyhound-like form which pursues deer, and the other more bulky with shorter legs which more frequently attacks the shepherd's flocks. Let us now take a more complex case. Certain plants excrete a sweet juice, apparently for the sake of eliminating something injurious from their sap. This is affected by glands at the base of the stipules in some leguminosa and at the back of the leaf of the common laurel. This juice, though small in quantity, is greedily sought by insects. Let us now suppose a little sweet juice or nectar to be excreted by the inner bases of the petals of a flower. In this case, insects in seeking the nectar would get dusted with pollen, and would certainly often transport the pollen from one flower to the stigma of another flower. The flowers of two distinct individuals of the same species would thus get crossed, and the act of crossing 
we have good reason to believe, as will hereafter be more fully alluded to, would produce very vigorous seedlings, which consequently would have the best chance of flourishing and surviving. Some of these seedlings would probably inherit the nectar-excreting power. Those individual flowers which had the largest glands or nectaries and which excreted most nectar would be oftenest visited by insects and would be oftenest crossed, and so in the long run would gain the upper hand. Those flowers also which had their stamens and pistils placed in relation to the size and habits of the particular insects which visited them, so as to favor in any degree the transport of their pollen from flower to flower, would likewise be favored or selected. We might have taken the case of insects visiting flowers for the sake of collecting pollen instead of nectar, and as pollen is formed for the sole object of fertilization, its destruction appears a simple loss to the plant. Yet, if a little pollen were carried, at first occasionally, and then habitually, by the pollen-devouring insects from flower to flower, and a cross thus affected, although nine-tenths of the pollen were destroyed, it might still be a great gain to the plant and those individuals which produced more and more pollen and had larger and larger anthers would be selected. When our plant, by this process of the continued preservation or natural selection of more and more attractive flowers, had been rendered highly attractive to insects, they would, unintentionally on their part, regularly carry pollen from flower to flower, and that they can most effectually do this I could easily show by many striking instances. I will give only one, not as a very striking case, but as likewise illustrating one step in the separation of the sexes of plants, presently to be alluded to. Some holly trees bear only male flowers, which have four stamens producing rather a small quantity of pollen and a rudimentary pistil. Other holly trees bear only female flowers. These have a full-sized pistil and four stamens with shriveled anthers, in which not a grain of pollen can be detected. Having found a female tree exactly 60 yards from a male tree, I put the stigmas of twenty flowers taken from different branches under the microscope, and on all, without exception, there were pollen grains, and on some a profusion of pollen. As the wind had set for several days, from the female to the male tree, the pollen could not thus have been carried. The weather had been cold and boisterous, and therefore not favorable to bees. Nevertheless, every female flower which I examined had been effectually fertilized by the bees, accidentally dusted with pollen, having flown from tree to tree in search of nectar. But to return to our imaginary case, as soon as the plant had been rendered so highly attractive to insects, that pollen was regularly carried from flower to flower, another process might commence. No naturalist doubts the advantage of what has been called the physiological division of labor. Hence we may believe that it would be advantageous to a plant to produce stamens alone in one flower, or on one whole plant, and pistils alone in another flower, or on another plant. In plants under culture and placed under new conditions of life, sometimes the male organs and sometimes the female organs become more or less impotent. Now if we suppose this to occur in ever so slight a degree under nature, then as pollen is already carried regularly from flower to flower, and as a more complete separation of the sexes of our plant 
would be advantageous on the principle of the division of labor. Individuals with this tendency, more and more increased, would be continually favored or selected, until at last a complete separation of the sexes would be effected. Let us now turn to the nectar-feeding insects in our imaginary case. We may suppose the plant of which we have been slowly increasing the nectar by continued selection to be a common plant, and that certain insects depended in main part on its nectar for food. I could give many facts showing how anxious bees are to save time. For instance, their habit of cutting holes and sucking the nectar at the bases of certain flowers, which they can, with a very little more trouble, enter by the mouth. Bearing such facts in mind, I can see no reason to doubt that an accidental deviation in the size and form of the body, or in the curvature and length of the proboscis, etc., far too slight to be appreciated by us, might profit a bee or other insect, so that an individual so characterized would be able to obtain its food more quickly, and so have a better chance of living and leaving descendants. Its descendants would probably inherit a tendency to a similar slight deviation of structure. The tubes of the corollas of the common red and incarnate clovers Trifolium pretense and incarnatum do not on a hasty glance appear to differ in length. Yet the hive bee can easily suck the nectar out of the incarnate clover, but not out of the common red clover, which is visited by humble bees alone, so that whole fields of the red clover offer in vain an abundant supply of precious nectar to the hive bee. Thus it might be a great advantage to the hive bee to have a slightly longer or differently constructed proboscis. On the other hand, I have found by experiment that the fertility of clover greatly depends on bees visiting and moving parts of the corolla so as to push the pollen onto the stigmatic surface. Hence again, if humble bees were to become rare in any country, it might be a great advantage to the red clover to have a shorter or more deeply divided tube to its corolla so that the hive bee could visit its flowers. Thus I can understand how a flower and a bee might slowly become, either simultaneously or one after the other, modified and adapted in the most perfect manner to each other by the continued preservation of individuals presenting mutual and slightly favorable deviations of structure. I am well aware that this doctrine of natural selection, exemplified in the above imaginary instances, is open to the same objections which were at first urged against Sir Charles Lyell's noble views on the modern changes of the earth as illustrative of geology. But we now very seldom hear the action, for instance, of the coast waves, called a trifling and insignificant cause, when applied to the excavation of gigantic valleys, or to the formation of the longest lines of inland cliffs. Natural selection can act only by the preservation and accumulation of infinitesimally small inherited modifications, each profitable to the preserved being. And as modern geology has almost banished such views, as the excavation of a great valley by a single alluvial wave, so will natural selection, if it be a true principle, banish the belief of the continued creation of new organic beings, or of any great and sudden modification in their structure. And with that rather profound statement, I think we'll end this evening's reading from On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. 
This book has had such a profound impact on science and life that I'm really enjoying reading it to you, especially as I know so many people have never read it. I hope you're enjoying it. If you'd like to read this classic work of science for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.